welcome to Uroro Niwa. My name is Mike Charlton. This is actually the second take of this video, and even though it's the first video of this series, and in fact the first video I've ever done on YouTube, I decided to throw away the first one and start again. Today I'm going to look at the game Dwarf Fortress, and I'm going to do maybe a little bit different way of doing a let's play or tutorial for this game. And uh, the first time I did this, I went through all of the options and showed all of the things that uh, uh, you could do in the game. And on reviewing it, I realized, while this is interesting, it's a lot of information. It's very hard to, to internalize it. And in fact, if you've tried to play the game Dwarf Fortress before, you may have found that, in fact, this is what this game is like. It's very overwhelming. And there's so many options and so much information that it's hard to keep track of it. I'm a software developer by trade. I've been working as a software developer for probably about 30 years now. And in fact, I would like to make a roguelike game. This, is, this channel is all about documenting my quest, as it were, to write my own roguelike game. A few years ago, I started to do research on existing roguelike games. And of course, if you've played Dwarf Fortress, it's a type of game that you'll never see anywhere else. It's, it's really unique. Uh, maybe I would say almost a genre onto its own. I was so intrigued by this game. I've played it now for about a year and I'm really just trying to find the corners of it and understand how, how it works because I want to use some of those ideas in my game as well. This channel, I'm going to document, as I said, the making of my game, but I'm, as well at the same time, I want to do sort of explore other games of similar genres and kind of show what makes them special. In this case, I'm going to start with Dwarf Fortress because it really is, I think, maybe the, the biggest influence um, that will that I'll have on the game that I'm writing. So instead of going into a lot of detail as I did the first time that I did this video, I'm going to try to just show you playing the game. And I think when I go through it, I'm going to do it in a different way than most people play the game. And when you see what I'm doing, I think you'll find that you'll pick up the nuances much more quickly and much more easily if I don't actually explain them. So uh, having said that, I'm going to get started and uh, we'll uh, try to, to do the best that we can. All right, you can see here, this is the main screen. Um, I, I've actually played Dwarf Fortress, as I said, for about a year now. So I have a lot of ongoing games um, and they're in my save file here. So you'll see them, but uh, we're going to start a whole new world. And Dwarf Fortress is all about creating a new world in which you can have your adventure. And I think that's the most unique part of this game. It allows you, it's a, it's a world generator as opposed to being really a game per se. There's a nice splash screen here, which you can read if you want. Now, one of the things is if you if you go and see some, some tutorials or if you go to the uh, for Fortress Wiki, which I'll put a link to in the notes, you'll see a lot of information on how this works. But I'm going to actually just go through it really quickly because I don't think it's necessary to to overload you with information. So I'm going to have a small world. Uh, the reason I want a small world is because I find that it's easier to understand what's happening in the world. I want to play a game in which we can really understand the mechanics of what's going on in the world, we can understand the history of the world, we can understand the politics of the world. And if you make the game large, it makes it very difficult to understand. And as you'll see, the, the names of places are very strange, so it's hard to remember what they are. It's hard to keep it all straight in your head. So I'm going to make a small world. I'm going to make the history fairly short. Um, the, Obviously, larger history has, makes a more rich environment, but also it means that a lot of the game plays itself out 
on its own. So, for instance, civilizations will have wars and will kill each other off and things like that. So I want to start somewhere at the beginning of the history, but enough that interesting things have happened. Number of civilizations, we could have a lot of them that would have more wars, or we can have less. And I, I want to actually have a little bit less because I want to have some space in the game. Number of sites, again, we'll keep it about minimum because I don't want to overwhelm you and myself, of course, with the number of cities and, and sites. So sites are just like cities in the world. Uh, the number of beasts, when it's talking about beasts here, it's talking about very large epic beasts like dragons and that kind of thing. So we want to have some because it makes the game interesting, but we don't, don't want to have too many because the beasts will really run amok and they'll destroy everything. So that can be quite fun, but for right now I just want something a little bit under control, so we'll just keep it medium. Savagery is more like uh, tigers and bears and lions and things. Usually I, I have it quite high because I find that quite interesting. Um, but today we're going to keep it low because, or medium, because it just makes the game a little bit easier. And I don't really want to have a challenging game at the moment. And finally, mineral occurrence. If you've played other sandbox type games, um, you know you have to kind of mine the earth and, and get metal and then use the metal to build things. And, and Dwarf Fortress is really kind of the original of that genre. And so you need to have these minerals in order to build things. The, the less you have, the more challenging it is because you have less access to these minerals. If you have lots of them, it makes it very easy to build stuff. I want to keep it pretty sparse because I don't really care actually in this game how we do. So we're going to go Y for go, but here we go. And so you see here, it's making a world. And on the left hand side, it's kind of counting through the years. It's actually simulating the world. So it's actually playing the game for you, essentially. And on the right hand side, you actually see the world that it's generating. Now, you'll see that the map has actually changed quickly. And that's because sometimes it says, oh, well, there's things that are unacceptable. And then again, it just changed again. So it will actually change the shape of the world to map certain parameters. And uh, so it changes it. And eventually when it's done, you can inspect the world that's done. I should point out um, that the world, I, I always imagined when I uh, when I made these worlds originally, when I started to play the game, that it's a whole world, you know, like a big globe, like Earth. Uh, and in fact, it's not really like that. It's, it's just a section of land. It's, and depending on how big you make your, your so-called world, it makes a bigger or smaller section. So we've made a small world, so we've had a smaller section. And you can see we're in the northern hemisphere, and there, up at the top here, you can see this the, this blue stuff is actually ice. Uh, this blue stuff here, the wavy stuff, I should point that at my cursor, because you may not be able to see it. That, that yellow one here is actually my cursor. So the stuff at the top, the blue stuff is ice. This is actually liquid water, so this is a sea. You can see green things here, those are trees. Um, these kind of ends and whatnot, those are hills and that kind of stuff. So I'm really not going to go through this because I'm going to go straight into what's called Legends mode. We're not going to play the game right away. I really actually want to, to get immersed into the world so that we understand what's in the world without having to discover it while we play. Um, one of the things about Dwarf Fortress is that it has three different play modes, and one of them is really just just a viewer of history called the Legends mode. And the other two are kind of uh, play play modes, and they expose you to different parts of the history of the world. And what I want to do is get immersed in it so that we can we can enjoy the world more when we actually start to play the game. But um, having said that, I don't want to really discuss too much about this because there's a lot of detail here and if you're not familiar with these maps you're going to look at this and think oh, this is just a complete mess. Like every rogue, roguelike this is of course all ASCII graphics. Um, uh, of course there, there are graphics packs for Dwarf Fortress. 
I am not using them. In fact, I'm using Vanilla Dwarf Fortress. This is uh, version 0.43.05, which is the latest version of this as of this recording. And I'm not going to use any mods in this playthrough. The reason for doing this is there's not that many uh, YouTube videos showing how to play the game like this. And this is the way I tend to play. And I think it's, it's interesting. So I thought it would be fun to show people. And as far as I'm concerned, anyway, you can you can look at this map and you have a choice here. You can see at the bottom, we can abort saying we don't like this world, uh, but I'm actually happy with it. So we're just going to accept it. And there we go. We, we've created a world. And once you've created the world, you can then use it um, over and over again. Again, it's one of the unique aspects of Dwarf Fortress is that your game is not limited to, for instance, the life of your character if you're playing in adventure mode or the life of your fortress if you're playing in fortress mode. It's the world itself and it's really building history. So we don't have any particular goals and in fact even if our adventurer dies or our, our fortress crumbles, that's not the end of the game. We can play as long as we like until we're tired and then we can create a new world if we want. And that is kind of the mindset of Dwarf Fortress and it's one of the things that makes Dwarf Fortress really unique. Now once we've created the world we're going to start playing and um, you'll see here's a list of actual worlds that I have here and some of these are actually co copies um, of different worlds but these are just ongoing games I have of other things and I'll explain kind of why you might want to copy your save file later. But this is the one we just built. I, I know it is because you'll see here it says region 4 as it will actually create the latest version it'll just say region and then the highest number is the last one you, you made. So I know this is the one we just made. And these other ones that have names I've actually renamed them just so I know which ones are and I have quite a few games ongoing as you can see. Um, so but I just have this this one here region 4 so we're going to go in here you have three options so legends adventure and fortress mode in legends mode you're just kind of exploring the world from a historical perspective uh, adventurer you it's like a typical rogue roguelike you wandering through the wilderness and fighting monsters generally speaking although once i show you this mode I, we're going to play a little bit more a little bit differently because i want to explore the role playing aspects of the game and finally the dwarf fortress mode we actually build things but like i said we're going to start with the legends mode because i think this is a this is an important mode and to be honest i'm not sure that i've seen any tutorial on the legends mode in in uh, youtube and i think it's quite a shame because it, it is i think an important part of the game um, and allows you, like I said, to get into the game. Now, you'll see here um, that there's many options we have, and I'm going to just show you at the top. We have uh, historical events left to discover. This is a kind of an advanced option. You can't actually set it from the UI, but if you change the configuration files, you can set this when you're creating the world that you're not given access to the legends of the world unless you have an adventurer that actually goes there and learns the history himself or herself. In this case, I didn't want to do that. We're just going to, and this is the default anyway, is we can inspect anything in Legends mode. So here we go. Um, the one thing I'm going to do before we start is actually, I'm going to show you really quickly, we're going to export the map gen info and it, I, that's just pressing p at the bottom you see here this is exporting some information some of this is actually really useful there's also an xml dump which is not particularly useful for us this is useful if you have an external tool to view the information we may do that later for the moment i'm not going to do it uh, there are also what are called these detailed maps and if i go into d you can see that there's many detailed maps now i'm going to i'm actually going to export one of them or one or two of them just so we can have a look at them and the ones I want to look at is here's the standard biome this is useful here yeah. standard biome and site map it takes a little while 
to complete. If you have a large world, it takes quite a long time. Now I'm going to get out of War Fortress and I'm going to quickly just this is um, this is just a shell interface. I run a Linux machine. You don't have to. You can go on a Macintosh or on a, on a Windows box, but I use Linux. And you'll see that I have a data directory. That's where all the save files are. I just do ls data. That ls stands for list directory, and that shows you the things that are in your data directory. And then if I go into saves, you can see I have. These are all of my saved games. And you can see I have Region 4 here as well. Now we could rename that to something else, but we'll just leave it at Region 4 for the moment. Here, you'll see that when I exported data, I've got this Region 4 data that's come out here. Now this is information that is quite useful. So we're gonna have a quick look at this first off. Now, this is something I, I think, in fact, I never looked at this until recently. And it's something I've never seen on a tutorial before, but I think it's really useful. So the first thing we're going to do is we're actually going to pull up um, some of these maps. I'm going to go to a different screen. You can see I use Arch Linux. But I'm going to uh, run a program called the GIMP. The GIMP is just an image editor. Uh, you could use any image viewer that you don't need to use. But this is free software. I, I tend to only use free software because that's go and um, here I'm just going to go into my home directory into Dwarf Fortress and then you can see I've got these two files here we've got um, a detailed uh, PMP stands for bitmap and we have the world map and I can't actually remember what's on these but let's have a look at both of them so here's a detailed map open that and here's our world this is quite this is quite nice actually I'm just going to zoom it a little bit because I'll do 200 just because it's a little bit nicer. Um, I always find that these maps are a little bit hard to read because the the color. So what I tend to do is if I go into tools here in the game, I can go to the color tools and I can change the brightness and contrast because I actually have vision problems. Um, and you'll notice that I use a very large font in Dwarf Fortress because of that. Um, and I like large large contrast so I can't really see maps that are really dark like that but this is a little bit better and here you can see here you can see our map and it's it's this is our this is the world that we that we generated and it's a little bit easier kind of to see what we're doing because we, we're dealing with graphics now and I think people find that a little bit easier to understand now um, I am not entirely sure what all of the things are, but you'll see that you have different colors here. So you see this blue here, you see the white, you see the green, you see the orange. And these are what are called different biomes. All right, they're different, um, they're different kinds of vegetation or, or that kind of thing. They're, and they're kind of color coded depending on what the uh, biomes are. Now, if I remember correctly, which I may not, but I think the white here are mountains the green are forests this lime green here are like plains and that kind of stuff the brown can be hills or deserts and that kind of stuff you see these all these blue lines here are are rivers and so we've got all these nice rivers that uh, snake through our our uh, country and i think that these brown lines, if I'm not mistaken, are actually roads. They, they may not be. On other worlds I've created, I haven't had nearly so many roads, but I think that that's what these are. You will also see these kind of multicolored splotches, and those are cities. All right? So you can see there's quite a few cities scattered throughout the uh, here. And here it's hard to see because of the color contrast, but these kind of square blocks here are also cities. And the square blocks are actually uh, goblin cities. And these round ones are, um, I can't remember, I think these ones are, are uh, dwarven type cities and these ones are possibly elven cities, uh, but I don't really know. Actually probably these yellow ones are humans, but who knows. You can see there's more, more goblins down here. So this kind of representation is not in the game at all, so it's not really necessary for you to understand it, but I find that this screen is a little bit easier to to look at and a little bit easier to understand. I'm going to open the other one now as well. 
Um, which one was I just here? Let's have a look at this one. Yeah. So this is this is the, uh, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'll just zoom it to 200%. No, that's actually too much. I zoom it to 100%. There we go. So, and this is the character representation, and this is the this is the representation that we're actually going to be using. So, uh, if I actually am smart about this, and I do not actually know how to do this, but I will just switch back and forth. You can see here that I'm looking at essentially the same part of the land. So this is what it looks like in graphics. This is what it looks like in characters. And so you can see it's pretty much the same thing. And here's the mountains coming through here, right? Same thing with this white section here, all these mountains in through here, right? All the green are forests in through here, right? Same thing, here's the forest in through here. Then you can see here these all these little kind of splotches here. These are all cities in through here, and there's cities here, the cities in through here, right? We look here, we'll actually see them here as well. Here's some cities here, all those all those kind of eyes with circumflexes, the yellow ones. Here's the uh, here's the these ones here are cities. These are all dwarven cities, right? Here's some some uh, human cities, and I'm not going to actually go through and show you this in detail because as we as we work with this, we'll actually learn what these are here. And up here, these are actually all the goblin cities, and there were more goblins down here as well. So that basically gives you an idea, and I think maybe. It's a little bit of a softer landing to say, okay, here's here's what the screen looks like in graphics. This is what it looks like in in ASCII characters. All right, so enough of that. For me, the most interesting part, or at the beginning, like when you're first starting to play the game, one of the most interesting parts of the game is the historical map. Now, um, again. I should just show you here. You just go to historical maps, press return, and you're you're back on the map. And you'll see here I have my my yellow cursor. As I move it up, I can go through the map because it doesn't all fit on one screen. Left and right is fine, but up and down you can uh, you have to scroll. Now this is the map as of year one. Now you'll see as well that we're missing all the color because this is kind of a historical map. And if I press enter again, it toggles it to a more to more um, again the color is not correct uh, but these are the characters that we're used to in the other screen so if I go back to um, I believe it was here here you can see if I just scroll this up a bit if I scroll between if I look between here you can see that these are essentially the same map right um, just for some reason I don't know why the color is not on this one um, but he just decided to didn't want the color. And if you press toggle again, you can see it's, it is still the same map, right? But it's just different color, and and for some of them it has different characters, and you'll be you may be wondering why that is. So I'm going to go through some of these characters with you, and what we have here is this is the map as of year one. So this is the beginning of history. This is what the map looked like, and here is. Um, I can I know that this is a human town. Human towns have these these bars here. So um, there's other shapes for human towns, but this is what one of the human towns look like, one type of human town. And so this is a human town, and the human town name when I put the cursor over it is Pujabora. Now this is a name in the the language of those humans, and in fact there is an English equivalent. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell you on this map, which is kind of frustrating. So sometimes you have to write these things down if you're interested. You will see as well that it has this thing here called the realm of creating. And you can see a little mark here, a um, little circle, and that is the, the symbol of a civilization called the realm of creating. Now the realm of creating are humans, and I know they're humans because they're in the human city. And this is the year one, so they're starting here. A civilization is just a group of, of, of people who live together. You can have multiple human civilizations. For instance, here, um, this is actually a dwarven civilization. You can see these little omegas here. Those are dwarven uh, fortresses. And here, uh, this dwarven fortress is called Besmarlular. The 
the civilization is called the town of sculpture. Yeah, these are strange names. I'm sorry. They're hard to remember. Which is one of the reasons why you shouldn't have a big world when you start. Because <laughs> it's really confusing. And here is another town. There is another fortress called Kogan Tat Tatlash. And the civilization is called the Exalted Shields. And these are both dwarves. You can see this is the Dwarven Fortress. This is also a Dwarven Fortress. As a, it's an Omega. Omega so these are both dwarven fortresses, but they're different civilizations of dwarves. They're different groups of dwarves. They might be friendly to each other, they might not be friendly to each other. And same thing over here is a civilization of humans. Over here, on the right hand side, you'll see this is a civilization of elves. And you can tell it's an elf because it has this kind of, of shape. And I'm not actually sure what this shape is. In Dwarf Fortress, this is the shape of, of mugs. I always think of it as a mug. And this is uh, Kulelin Debi, perhaps. Uh, the Whisker of Equality is the name of civilization. And of course, like I said, that's the name at the top, is the name of the city. This is the name of civilization. This is the symbol of the civilization. Up at the top here, you'll see there is, this is actually a goblin civilization. Right? Remember in our original map when we when we looked over here in this original map when I scroll up right to this area you see all this purple up here all of these purple zero things you can see the pie here as well these are dwarven or sorry goblin goblin cities essentially right so you can see the goblins have expanded by the year 125 which is when this map was created and this is in year one there was only the one this is actually a goblin fortress and the goblin fortress is called uh, Stulzom and their civilization is called the Bloated Midnight. Sometimes you can tell what the civilization is just by looking at the name because the game is actually pretty good at trying to pick civilizations that um, like names that might go with that type of race. Now over here on the left you may actually see this red dot here. It's not actually a city or anything. It's actually a volcano. It is kind of unfortunately right in the middle of the ocean so no one can get to it. But um, That's what volcanoes look like and I don't think I have any other volcanoes on the screen. Um, yes, there's no other volcanoes on the map, it seems. Um, so there's other, there's other kind of places here. So here, um, this is a place called uh, Dugugulis. Now, you'll notice that the, there's a name of a city, but not a name of a civilization. Or, sorry, no, this is actually a name of civilization, but there's no name of a city. And this is because this is a cobalt civilization. All right? so these are the cobalt, and they don't actually really live in the city. They kind of squat, mostly. And in fact, you'll find that cobalts tend to, um, tend to migrate into towns that have been uh, raised and that have no inhabitants. So they just kind of squat in those places. There's another elf civilization down here. I think these are more kobolds down here. I can't tell from, yeah, so you can see. Uh, can't really tell from the, the symbol, except for the fact that it's not a symbol of, a normal symbol for a city. Now, the last thing I want to show you here is if I actually press uh, plus, I can actually go through the years. Now this is 10 years later. They, the only thing about this map which is frustrating is that it goes from, it goes in 10 year increments. So I go, I start at year one, then I go year 10, year 20, year 30, year 40, year 50. Using the symbol of the civilization. So here's the symbol of the diamond, right? So if I go plus, you can see, in fact, in 10 years, this fortress here, these guys have spread out all through here. Right? very quickly. So they control all of this land or they 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 have an influence in all of this land. And here you can see here these guys here again if I go back to year one I go up to this fortress here you can see here there this little asterisk right? and if I go plus they're spreading out in this direction but they're coming into conflict with this original fortress. So if I move my cursor in here, you'll actually see that now 
the diamond guys, which are these guys here, which is the exalted shield, are coming in conflict with the town of Sculpture, which are these guys who started here, I believe. Is that right? No, they actually started up here. And in fact, that's changed shape. And I, it, it's become a mu, and I can never remember what that means, uh, whether that is, um, that means their fortress has upgraded or downgraded, <laughs> but whichever it is, um, their their fortress has changed slightly. But this is where their home base is, and this is where these guys' home base is. And we can move through the years and see what's happened in history. And as you can see, these kobolds here are not having a good time of it. They're getting they're getting um, hit on every side. And they they've carved out a little area down here in the below, but the um, the exalted shield is really doing quite well. They're expanding quite a lot, whereas again, like the humans here in the realm of creating, are getting squeezed out. It's getting squeezed out between the elves over on this side, right? Where these little purple club guys are competing in all this territory in here. Whereas the goblins up here have no one to compete with at all, so they can grow unimpeded, right? And the humans over here again have quite a lot of space. They're they come in contact, but they're not actually in conflict. Now, later, when we get a little bit further, we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about wars as well. And so, this doesn't mean just because they're just because they are occupying the same land, or like they have a claim. Each one of these groups has a claim over this land. Doesn't necessarily mean that they're at war. Doesn't mean there actually have been battles. And we're going to talk about um, how we can actually see the battles that have happened over the years. And so you can see how these civilizations have grown over time. And it does get to be quite complicated after a while. And you can see once we get, oh sorry, once we get to year 20, our current time frame is year 125. But like I said, it only does 10 years at a time. But after, once we get up to year 125, you can see this situation is very complex, right? Um, the exalted shield is everywhere. So this is our new current situation here. They have influence absolutely everywhere, and this may be trade routes, this may be um, this may be uh, wars, but basically got their got their fingers in everything. You can see these humans over here, uh, whose names I forget. Um, so the little F's guys were humans, the Confederacy of Crystal. Um, they're in conflict with the realm of creating, which I believe were also um, humans. So we can go here. Yeah, it's hard, really hard to tell. If I go, if I just go plus again and one more plus, we can see. Oh no, the little. That's right. The realm of creating is these humans here. So you can see that. Actually, if I go back again to year twenty, you can see that the realm of creating got pushed all the way over to here. They started out here, and they've actually been split. So they've got these human cities up in here. They've actually been split into two groups. Um, so they're probably not long for this world. They've been, they've been pushed over here, whereas these F guys as well are in conflict with them. And as we as we explore the world, we're going to um, see, we're going to learn more about these uh, these civilizations, and we're going to to start to understand the relationships with them better. At first, it's pretty hard to understand. And it's really overwhelming, which is why you, I think it's worthwhile to spend this time at the beginning to learn about the world that you're in. That's what we're going to leave it at for today. I've gone well over. In fact, I've gone much over what I did in the first take. So next time, uh, we're going to look at a few more tools of the history and we're going to learn more about the events that happened, the wars that happened, and maybe some of the heroes and, and the people involved in the world. Eventually, once we have our fill of that, we will probably find a nice place to start a fortress and um, do that. I'm not sure whether I'll go try and do some adventure mode first and then go into fortress mode or whether we'll go straight into fortress mode. But until next time, uh, my name is Mike Charlton. This is Uru Uru Niwa and I hope to see you next time.